I was going to end the poll. And the results of the poll are that 50% of respondents said that uh, one of the key challenges with data protection impact assessments is that they are complex for small projects. And uh, other 50% said that getting people to do them in the first place was one of the, one of the challenges. Again, that's something we encounter a lot. And in the context of today's webinar, one thing we want to help educate people on is how a DPA might not always be the right tool for the job, and that might help improve the ability for people to engage with a DPIA uh, going forward. Joining me this morning, I have Peter Davey, uh, Operations Director in Castlebridge. Uh, Peter, don't introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Peter Davey, I'm Operations Director at Castlebridge. My role here is to make sure that we deliver to our clients the best of our ability. Uh, and the reason for this webinar is to discuss some of the challenges you know, that we sometimes meet in the course of our work. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, the form for today is essentially Peter is going to uh, interview me uh, as the, the, the setup for the webinar, which allows us to lead into a, a couple of key concepts um, as we go through. In terms of the inspiration of this webinar, it, it has, as Peter said, come from our uh, experience with clients uh, on a number of projects where uh, the request for proposal was specifying a DPIA when what was being asked for was something else, what was needed was something else, or in the course of executing a, a DPIA with, with clients, their expectation of what the output would be, um, and what the objective was, differed uh, in some respects from what good practice would be and what the, the structure of a DPIA, DPIA would need to be uh, to deliver results to the organization. Um, Ultimately, our objective today, uh, Peter, do you want to uh, chime in here also on YouTube? Um, the objective today is to have to understand the toolkit. Indeed, uh, it's to understand the toolkit and to understand how that toolkit can be applied to different you know, types of scope, to different, uh, you know, depending on whether we want to look past, whether we want to look future. Uh, you know, we, use you know, we use a different type uh, of intervention and engagement. Uh, and ideally, what I'd like to get from today is an understanding uh, of what the purpose of each of these types of engagement is, what it will deliver for us, and what will deliver for you know, the benefits to the organisation. So the key thing is it's about understanding what is the job we're trying to do, and what is the right tool for the job. So as part of having to frame this discussion. Um, this is the mandatory introducing ourselves slide. I'm Daryl O'Brien, um, and Peter is Peter Davy. As you can see, we both have uh, quite extensive experience in management consulting and information management uh, in Ireland, the EU, and further afield. Um, in terms of the tools we're looking to apply um, that we're going to be talking about today, the tools that are in the toolbox we're going to discuss, we have the data protection impact assessment and privacy impact assessment. We have a data protection compliance audit. We have a data protection capability maturity assessment. And we have a post implementation review or after action review for incidents, um, which are four types of assessment tool that the C organization is using and deploying and applying in the, in, in the organization. And it's the case that we often find that organizations are using the wrong tool for the right job or the right tool for the wrong job. Peter, do you want to? Ch uh, yes, it's not uncommon uh, for us to yeah, enter into engagements where we're being asked uh, to do one particular type of engagement. The client's expectations you know, seem to run well beyond that. Uh, um, I think to a certain extent it may be uh, you know, driven uh, by the different parties that you know, can become involved. Uh, in different types of governance projects, uh, depending on the background, yeah, effectively, uh, yeah, the industry you know comes from on the one hand accounting firms and you know, a law background, and on the third tech, you know, technology, and depending on I suppose where you were brought up, uh, that to a certain extent sets your expectations, uh, and so in the market there's a lot of grayness, there's a lack of clarity uh, on what particular to you know we should be using in a particular area so for example you know, 
what is the purpose of a privacy impact assessment? You know, and yeah, what what will the results be uh, as against an audit? Uh, so, uh, you know, c c can you help explain some of that there? Well, that's what we're here to do today, Peter. Uh, the key thing is, from a council's perspective, we're coming at this from a slightly interesting perspective, so a different perspective. You reference the accounting, legal, or technology perspectives. Council which comes this from an information management and information governance perspective. So we, but we've historically been the meat and the sandwich, and, our, and, and as the meat and the sandwich, we're looking at these different requirements and different needs, and we're, it, it's obvious that there are different requirements and different tools, and it's about understanding when to use them is the key thing. So um, the objective for today is to help us understand the different types of assessment, to understand the difference between the tools, and to understand when each type is relevant, and to help understand what the scope is when you're asking for someone to do this type of assessment, uh, what, what the scope of it would be. Um, I think, Peter, in terms of helping people understand what the right tool to use is in a particular context, and what the difference is uh, between the DPIA, um, a capability maturity assessment, an audit, or a, a post implementation review. Um, what we were encountering quite a lot with organizations is that if the only tool you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So, a lot of organizations we've gone into where they have had a DPIA done or a thing that has been labeled a DPIA, and there's one organization we've worked with where a large consultancy uh, did data flow mapping and labeled it as DPIAs. Uh, which means that organization's understanding of what a DPIA, DPIA is, is quite significantly skewed from what an impact assessment on data protection issues uh, would, would be. But if you, the only thing you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So the key thing is within our projects, within the, the project environment we work in uh, with clients, there are usually four things we're trying to do. At, at different times. We're looking to either design something, and my laser pointer over here, we're looking to design something, we're looking to inform the organization about something, we're looking to implement or operate a control on something, or we're looking to evolve the organization. And in that context, having the right tool for the job is very important. So this DICE acronym, Design, Inform, Control, and Evolve, helps us navigate what purpose we have for our assessment at a given time, and that purpose and that objective frames what the structure, scope, objective, format, and outputs that we should expect should be in the context of that type of engagement, ultimately dictating what's the right tool for the job. So we reach into our toolbox, um, from when we're working with clients, we're always asking ourselves, is this something where we're trying to design something for the client, where they're implementing something new, and there's a design element to make sure it's being implemented right? Are the, is the client looking to be informed about how the organization is performing? Are we operating in control to make sure that things are running the way they should? Uh, or is the organization trying to make a step change in their capability? Peter, do you want to chime in? Yes, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, the, the, this is a great model, Dara, uh, because it gives us uh, you know, something to assess against. It gives us something to uh, help us to define what these different tools are going to do. So, As we look forward to the different tools then, we have this framework, the DICE framework, Design, Inform, Control, and Evolve. When we look to design something, our objective is to identify the specification of the processing activities, the processes or technologies that are achieving a business goal. So we're designing what those things are, and we're trying to get the spec right. Now, when people ask me, when's the right time to do a privacy impact assessment? I always say, usually six steps in the project earlier than someone came to me saying, should I do a DPIA? Uh, I've done some work with Public Affairs Ireland, training procurement managers in public sector bodies, for example, on the role of a DPIA in setting the specification for procurement tenders. If we're looking to inform the organization, the objective of our activity is to measure performance against a target, identifying is the defined standard being met. And this is usually a point in time assessment. So it's a snapshot uh, to inform the organization of where it is. From a control perspective, we're looking to make sure that processes 
have been executed according to the required governance objectives and that they're being addressed on an ongoing basis. So again, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on. But this isn't an audit. This is a checkpoint at the end of the deployment of a project, the introduction of a new system, and it's an ongoing part of your, your governance rather than a point-in-time snapshot view of how the organization is doing in a particular way. The final one, this is one where I think organizations that are approaching data protection and data governance from a strategic perspective are beginning to see value uh, from work we're doing with them. Um, the Evolve, this is where the organization is looking at how it can improve and what competencies, not simply what policies, procedures, technologies are missing or underperforming, what management competencies does the organization have to develop to meet a target standard, to meet a target objective, a target level of capability in terms of data protection management, in terms of data governance, in terms of data quality, et cetera, across the organization. Um, Peter, what's your, your take on, on those three different, on those four different levels? I think that, yeah, the, 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 simply by looking at the framework there, yeah, I'm beginning to gain an understanding uh, of where some of these types of tools, which boxes, which buckets they would fit into. Uh, and it's certainly a useful, you know, it's a very, very useful analysis, uh, which I think is going to help to inform the subject. So, having P having Peter on board, and this is my big challenge in Casamage. If I can convince Peter that a model is a good idea, chances are it's a good idea. Um, and this has evolved from our, our work with clients over the past number of years. Uh, because it helps us identify what is the objective, what's the priority in the uh, activity. So, when we look at a data protection impact assessment, a data protection impact assessment, its objective is ultimately design. A DPIA is about privacy by design or data protection by design. The objective is to make sure the organization has identified the things that might go wrong and to determine appropriate mitigations to those issues, risks or challenges from the point of view of the impact on fundamental rights and freedoms of data subjects, but also understanding the impact on the business objectives of the organization of the mitigations that have been put in place and the trade-offs that might need to be managed uh, as part of the design and implementation or execution of processing. So one of the key aspects within this is that you need to be identifying whether or not the risks that are associated with the processing are proportional to the benefits. So it's designing the trade-offs, it's designing the process, it's about identifying how you are going to build this thing. So from a data protection officer's point of view, you are making sure the organization is stopped and actually come up with a plan and a design for doing the thing that meets the required standards uh, and then has identified the, the, the likely issues and risks that might emerge uh, in the implementation of the project or the technology. <clears throat> the methodology for this is future looking. And this is a key element of a DPIA. If the process is already in place, you are not performing a data protection impact assessment. You are doing some other thing. Would you agree, Peter? Very definitely. Uh, you know, the, all DPIAs must be future looking. Uh, you know, you know, you know, because in theory, I know this doesn't necessarily happen in practice, uh, but in theory, you know, you should be doing the DPIA before you take the action. Uh, you know, you are supposed to you know, be identifying the risks before you do something, so it must be future looking. So in the context of being future looking, we are then trying to get to a point where we are including consideration of external stakeholder perspectives. This is another aspect of a DPIA. It has to be outward looking. It has to consider who are the data subjects, who are the other stakeholders involved in the processing who might have interests that need to be balanced or considered. And if you look at the various frameworks for DPIAs that exist, um, one of the key aspects of all of them, and DPC asks this on a regular basis when, we, when we're doing reviews of DPIAs uh, with them, uh, how did you go about reflecting the external stakeholders' perspective? And your methodology for doing it, whatever way you were approaching a DPIA, and a lot of organizations we've seen, one, uh, 
public sector organization in uh, another former European Union country. Um, they have a 37 tab Excel spreadsheet that they were being asked to fill out for a DPIA. Um, that methodology was very prescriptive, but what it actually needs to be is explorative. So how do you identify the issues and risks? What are the benefits and where is the win-win? And if your DPIA methodology isn't enabling you to do that at a level that's appropriate for the scale of the project, if you were taking a hammer to crack a nut, well, you've opened your toolbox and you've taken out a sledgehammer when what you needed possibly was a, a small tapping hammer. Um, and that's why or individuals and organizations often resist DPIAs is that the tool, the methodology the organization is applying hasn't been designed to scale with the level of project or the level of risk inherent in terms of the, the processing. Here. Jump in on that. Yes, uh, you know, it's quite common where, you know, the, uh, as you scale up, uh, you know, it's quite common uh, that organizations haven't really understood uh, that the scale they've reached is you know, giving them new problems. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the methodology that we use uh, you know, has to be explored to understand uh, you know, how we can you know, both protect the rights and you know, allow the organization to you know, perform its functions as well. So in that context then, from a design perspective, it's important to design your methodology and your approach to doing DPIAs so that it can be as simple as a six step or 10 step drill. And again, the, the army of G7 member state, I think they're, they were a G7 when we worked with them, they might've gone down the ranking since. Um, they went from a 37 tab Excel spreadsheet to a six step drill on the, on the military side because the military side understood a drill and that enabled them to implement a structured way of looking at any project where personal data was being processed to determine what the issues and risks were, what the benefits were, and where was the victory, where was the win-win for them. And last I heard, the, the, the integration with the 37-tab 37, 37 Excel spreadsheet was that a civilian filled out the spreadsheet while the military asked the relevant questions to produce the right answers. In terms of what good looks like in a DPIA, um, you need to have looked at all the possible risks in a broadly scoped examination. And you need to be looking at all the risks to the data subjects and to the organization. And this is an important one because having reviewed DPIAs for clients that, have been, that they've done internally or have been done uh, historically, one of the key problems is the scope of what the assessment is looking at is defined too narrowly. You have the scope of the risks that are allowed to be spoken of and considered is curtailed your DPIA is ineffective. The, the classic joke is that from the First World War is that it wasn't the bullet you saw that got you. And from a risk management perspective in a DPIA, it isn't the risks that you've documented and that you've signed off on that everyone's happy can be included or are going to trip you up. It's the risks that are maybe low probability, but high impact that they occur. And that's why it's worth including in your DPIA, even those low level, minor issues and risks so that at least there's visibility of them and you can make a, a reasoned determination on the action that's been taken. Because ultimately, good in a DPIA is a plan. It's a set of recommendations for your specification to remediate the risk both to the organization and to data subjects. And it has to be accessible to external parties. You need to think about your audience for this, because the DPIA is not just an internal governance document. Peter? Yeah, hey, definitely. You know, it's, you know, it's an assessment that you're going to have to take uh, you know, on, on behalf of the people outside. and You'd have to be able to share that, you know, either on the freedom of information or uh, you know, simply under your transparency policy uh, with interested parties. Uh, and you know, we shouldn't be afraid of that. Uh, you know, we should be happy to tell uh, the people you know, that are using our services, what is what it is we're doing with their data. I think it's worth considering who the audiences would be for a DPIA when you are putting one together. Uh, the audiences could be the Data Protection Commissioner, it could be your systems implementers who are trying to understand the spec and understand the rationale for the specification, it could be your procurement function 
we're trying to take those recommendations for the remediation of a risk and put that into a tender specification for software, for uh, technology services, or for advisory services. The other aspect with the DPIA framework is that the level of analysis has to be proportionate to the level of risk. Now, chicken and egg here, how do you know the level of risk if you haven't done a certain level of analysis? And that's where a scalable, repeatable process that iterates the detail as you find out more risk is an important aspect. And, you know, when we teach DPIAs with Public Affairs Ireland and other organizations, um, the Law Society, we train, teach clients that your DPIA is a, a process where you're not deciding to continue, it's a process where you're deciding to stop asking questions, not deciding to continue asking questions. So a structured, scalable model where it is a standard set of steps that are repeated iteratively for more and more information is a way of building that level of proportionality and relative to the risk. But ultimately, it cannot be a tick box exercise. And as this is something that often prompts a rant in the office, I'm going to hand over to the, the rancher in chief in Castlebridge, Mr. Davy, just to share his thoughts on this one. Uh, we're often faced uh, with organizations uh, that have uh, got people in to have a look at particular risks, and you know, they've by and large ignored the elephant in the room. Uh, because they don't want to upset the client by pointing out the elephant in the room. And the Castle Bridge approach is very much that you, know, you need to be aware of the elephant in the room, you need, you, you need to remediate that, uh, because that's what's going to trip you up. Uh, and we find that, you know, so you know, we get told you know, this isn't in scope, of course it's in scope, uh, you know, just because it's external to the organization, you know, you're still responsible, uh, you still have liability. Uh, and there's a general feeling that you know, if we ask the right questions, then we'll get the answer that we want. Uh, whereas you know, we would prefer to ask all of the questions uh, to get a true and correct answer in which we can plan, uh, rather than an idealized and unrealistic answer uh, due to not giving the full facts in the first place. And the other aspect of that is if there is a curtailment of scope or a curtailment of vision in terms of the questions that can be asked. And if a DPA is being approached as, I'll just fill out this form and then I can move on to the next step in the process, if it's treated as a tick box, it's not serving its objective as a design artifact in the organization. It needs to ask, what are the expectations of our data subjects, of downstream users of the data, what are the issues and risks that are involved, so that you get an appropriate design artifact out of it, so that when you are formalizing your spec when you were moving things forward in your project, uh, you aren't simply saying, as they did in the uh, legendary Titanic, are, the, are things riveted? Yes. However, the quality of the rivets had been curtailed to save cost. Good Northern Ireland engineering. So as you said, just to summarize the common pitfalls and mistakes, one of the common mistakes and pitfalls we see with DPIAs is taking a narrow focus which avoids looking at obvious risks, as Peter said, avoiding the elephant in the room. Another risk, another pitfall is framing the questions to fit the required answer, prejudging the outcome. Uh, and that's essentially the same as specking a procurement tender so that it fits only one possible provider. Um, there are rules against that in procurement uh, likewise, in a DPIA, you need to make sure that you're not prejudging the outcome by framing the questions too tightly. And the final common mistake is that tick box approach where it's seen as a stepping stone to get to the next thing rather than being an integral and important part of the design process for the services, functions and features of your organization. The next thing we're going to talk about is data protection compliance audits. Now, an audit is different to a privacy impact assessment. But again, we have seen organizations who are using, uh, going into tender looking for DPIAs, but what they're actually asking to be done is a compliance audit, which is a completely different thing that requires a slightly different approach, has slightly different inputs and outputs, and um, depending on the scale of the organization, <laughs> may require a different level of resource to be allocated to it to execute it correctly. 
The objective of an order is to inform. And as part of informing, we need to be thinking about the scope of the order. Because within an order, yes, you can narrow the scope. Because you might want to focus on a particular area of your organization. You might want to focus on a particular aspect of processing. You might be focusing on a particular third-party supplier and their involvement in your processing. And you are measuring against defined standards. And ultimately, it's a pass-fail judgment. A key element of an audit is there are defined documented policies and procedures that exist that are the specified requirement for how things should be done. And again, part of an audit might be identifying, are those policies in existence, yes or no? And that's a pass-fail. But there is some standard that you're referring to that is identifying what it is you are assessing against. And the scope of your audit is very, very important to get right. Peter. Yes, uh, it's very, very important that uh, you know when we scope an audit, we understand what it is that we're benchmarking against. Uh, and we understand what the standards are, but it is very much pass and fail in any audit. Uh, you know, if we think of our financial audits there, uh, you know, they're telling us stuff that happened six months ago in the past. Uh, and they're telling it uh, as of what happened on one single date. Uh, yeah, financial audits don't necessarily bear a great deal of relationship to what's going on in the business today. And again, having worked with clients, and I worked in a previous role where we were all regularly audited by regulators, um, it is it can be easy to game an audit if you understand the scope and if you understand the plan and if you decide to spend, send half of your marketing department on an away day to Cork because you don't want them to be available to answer the questions. Not that anyone I've ever worked with did that. In terms of the methodology, a methodology and a format for an audit is an, adherent, is, is an assessment of an adherence to policies, processes, standards at a point in time and it's a narrowly defined scope with pass, fail, and management comment, or, or as, as we sometimes call them, excuses. And this is where you are justifying why there is a deficiency. And if the deficiency has been identified, and you're explaining, well, this is what the deficiency is, and this is what we plan to do, or this is what is in train to remediate this thing that on this day is not meeting the standard that we have defined for this processing. Um, so in that context, the scope is important, but that ability for management to give feedback. Whereas a data protection impact assessment is a design activity where it's more iterative and where the engagement is focused on defining at the end a specification and a set of things that will be done and will be implemented as part of a project. And all of it is about identifying a pass-fail situation which management can then comment on and either push back on uh, seeking uh, a change in the audit in the audit finding, or where management can provide a mitigation by way of management comment. Peter, anything to add on that? Uh, no, uh, you know it's yeah. You know, this is standard audit methodology. So, in an audit. Good requires a clearly defined scope. One of the things we find with clients when we're asked to do an audit, uh, from the point of view of us pitching or costing the work, um, it's important for, for there to be an understanding of what is the start and stop point of the scope of the audit. Is it an audit of the entire organization? Everything to do with data protection from soup to nuts, which will cost X, or is it an audit of a marketing process or a particular procurement process or some aspect of the organization. Again, that affects the scale, it affects the level of resources. As part of that audit process, as part of the scoping of the audit, there needs to be clear statements of what is the standard that is being expected. There needs to be a functional statement of the standard. And again, the pass-fail criteria need to be clearly defined. What constitutes an acceptable level within the standard? Uh, is it the existence of a document? Is it the existence of people having been trained? Again, to give you an example of where an audit might be different to a, a, a capability 
assessment. In an audit, it's absolutely sufficient for you to demonstrate that staff are trained. However, unless the audit's asking, do staff remember what they were trained in and are they actually applying what they were trained in? If your evidence of the existence of training is that people signed up and went on an online course and did an assessment, that's a that'll pass your audit, but it doesn't necessarily indicate that the organization has improved its capability to manage data and to manage data protection. Some common pitfalls and mistakes. Peter, I'm going to let you take this one because uh, I'm croaking a little bit. Uh, well, you know, the most common uh, is that, you know, having been audited, uh, it presumes that the fine st standard is fit for purpose. And, you know, this goes, you know, this goes very much to the level of ambition of the organization in terms of governance. Uh, you know, it's perfectly possible to be what I call bare bones compliant. Uh, but not have taken on any of the, on board any of the benefits uh, and any of the uh, learning uh, that would be preserved uh, a progressive organisation would have. Uh, another issue with an audit is that you know it won't cover the common quality issues uh, in either policy or process because we're not really looking at that. You know, we, 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 we should be accepting that the policies are there, whether they're fit for purpose or not. Uh, that the processes are there, but we may not actually be mapping down to the process level to ensure that everybody is, uh, uh, yeah, ensure that everybody is following that. Uh, you know, certainly when we uh, go into organisations, it's very, very common uh, for me to be told, yes, we have policies, yes, we have processes. They live in the cupboard in the corner, uh, and when I look in the cupboard, there's a big book of policies and processes which bear absolutely no relationship. Uh, to the way business is done in that organisation, but they're great things to have, cracking dust in the cupboard. Uh, and of course, you're right, audit is always retrospective, we're always looking backwards. And I suppose that's got to be one of the major differences uh, between a forward looking function, uh, like a data protection impact assessment, uh, and an audit where we're looking backwards, we're looking to see have we been doing the right things. Uh, and it doesn't ask us, uh, are we doing the right things? And it only asks us, you know, are we doing things right? Uh, and that comes that you know, either when we say right, we mean we're doing it to the standard that we have set for ourselves, which goes back again to the level of ambition that I mentioned at the beginning.
if I appear to be on mute there for a moment, so I'm going to jump back for a second. Uh, technology, it's fantastic. So when we're looking at uh, the objective of a capability maturity assessment, we're looking to evolve the organization. We're looking to improve the overall structure of the organization in respect of its ability to do things. In this case, managing data, managing data protection, or governing data. It's based off a gap analysis assessment where we identify where we are and what we need to do to get to the next level. And it gives us a baseline of what's been achieved or achieved, if you pardon the typo, and lets us know what else needs to be done. So what have we, where have we come from? What have we done? What do we still need to do? And gives a clear roadmap in terms of descriptive, clear statements of capability that, that can be implemented to move the organization up the, the, the hierarchy. Within that, the more methodology and approach is an assessment against defined statements of capability. So what does the organization look like at different levels of maturity, at different levels of capability maturity? And then when we look, when we look at the managing practices and behaviors in the organization and assess them against those defined statements of capability, what level does the organization appear to be at? And that's usually done using a survey-based or observation-based approach against these objective criteria. And one of the key focus points of a maturity assessment isn't just where you are and where you want to go, but also are you able to get there? Or more importantly, how long will it take you to get there? What level of investment or effort will be required to move you from one level to another? This is an example of a maturity scale from the Carnegie Mellon Institute Data Management Maturity Framework, uh, the DMM. All of these maturity scales have five levels. Um, all of them are labeled something from performed to optimized, ad hoc to optimized. Um, but I, I like the CMLI one because it comes from a very long history of quality management principles. At the perform level, you are doing some stuff on an ad hoc basis at project level. And everything's been managed as a requirement for the implementation of projects. As you move up the hierarchy of things in terms of different data management capabilities, you look at things, are things being planned and executed in accordance with a policy? Are people aware of data as a critical infrastructure asset in the organization for how you do execute your functions? And ultimately, up to level five, where you're saying that you're measuring your data and you're using performance management, performance measurement to optimize your strategy for managing data in the organization and across the organization. Most organizations, level three is the ideal optimal level to target at. For public sector bodies, uh, what we found is that most of them tend to be sitting between a one and a two uh, with some elements of two to three level behaviors uh, across the board. And again, in an organization across different aspects of data management, different management practices that you want to be applying, and in different areas of the organization, you will find different levels of capability. That allows you to call out role model behaviors and example implementations that bring the organization along a change management journey. So what does good look like? Well. The first thing is a good capability maturity assessment identifies your current state, warts and all, and also shows you what's working well. So a, a SWOT analysis will be a, a key aspect of a capability maturity assessment. It'll have a plan and a roadmap for bringing you up a level. And what levels will you get to? What's your plan for doing that? Another key element of a capability maturity assessment is it allows you to pull yourself back from what I call the data protection tunnel vision. Peter, do you want to talk a bit about the, the tunnel vision and strategic value add? Uh, I suppose, uh, you know, from the point of view of tunnel vision, uh, particularly when you're, you know, people only think in terms of data protection, they don't think in terms of, you know, what are the benefits to, uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily think in balance test. Uh, you know, people just think, oh, that you know, GDPR prevents us from doing that. It becomes a parrot response, uh, and you know, sometimes if you pull back, if you consider uh, the wider aspect, uh, you can start to see that there's probably a benefit, uh, you know, in taking a more holistic approach. 
uh, and certainly, you know, as you know, as strategic value add, anything that is improving the reputation of the organization, improving the handling of data, and you know, any organization that understands where their data is, what it is, uh, and what they actually use it for, is in a far, far better position to be able to benefit from that. Uh, in terms of analytics, in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, and in terms of you know, using evidence-based decision-making uh, to produce the best outcomes for the organization. And even beyond the, the fancy stuff of AI and, and machine learning in organizations, the basics of good information management uh, have significant impacts in relation to the costs and efficiencies in organizations. So, uh, research out of UCC and the IMI uh, has found that less than 3% of organizations have data that's fit for purpose. And 30 years of research in various organizations on the cost of poor quality data puts that between 10 and 30% of the organization's operating budget. So while everyone's worrying about 4% of turnover fines possibly happening, everyone's quite happily funneling money into a corner and setting fire to it in terms of data management capabilities in organizations. So a DPO who's thinking strategically should be looking at the capability model more data in their organization and doing a maturity assessment, which would bring in things like ARP DPIA has been done, do people understand the value of data and the risks to the value of data in the organization to help bring data protection forward as a strategic value add, as Pete has said. Common pitfalls and mistakes we see with uh, maturity assessments. Setting too much of a stretch goal. Uh, is one that often happens. You find yourself at a one, and someone says, I want to be a three by next September, and it's July. Um, doing too much change too soon is a problem, and you need to be very realistic in the roadmap that you set. Um, the level of the organization's ambition is also important. Maybe a level two is appropriate, maybe level three. I've seen organization leaders, CEOs, you know, I want to be level five. And goes, I've been in a couple of um, chief data officer steering groups internationally where uh, the key thing that happens is you put a number in front of a senior manager and a senior manager wants that be, they want to find out how are their peers, how's everyone else in my sector doing, how are other government departments doing, how are other public sector bodies doing and everyone wants to be a four or a five and everyone wants to be better than the other guy but you need to rein that in to actually make sure it's an achievable ambition. Another key mistake is not engaging all the relevant stakeholders on the business side and on the IT side. What we see happening in organizations who try a capability maturity assessment, looking at it from the IT perspective only, is that the end game is, the end result is a maturity assessment that says everything will be fine if we didn't have any users. If we didn't have to deal with any people's data, if we didn't have anything coming through our systems, we can make these, these things work really, really well. But you need to be understanding the implications and impacts of your data management capabilities on business operations and aligning with business strategy. And another key element of it is grading people at a two or a three without being able to back it up against the objective statements. Or grading people at a, at a one without evidence. You need to be able to trust but verify so that if someone challenges your number, challenges your assessment, you're able to back it up. Finally, we're going to talk about post-implementation reviews. This is one that's often overlooked from a data, from a, a data protection perspective. Uh, again, a DPIA is a design activity in a project. Um, a capability assessment is a, a, project, a process to evolve the organization. Um, your audit is to inform the organization. Post-implementation review uh, is ultimately about control. It's about verifying that things that were supposed to be done in the project have actually been done. So it is a control process. And another key element of a, a post-implementation review is to gather lessons learned so you can inform the design process, you can inform the audit process, and you can inform the evolution of the organization. Those lessons learned are an important key output of a post-implementation review. The formative methodology is really simple, and anyone who's done a post-implementation review in any project will be reasonably familiar with these. What was the thing that was supposed to be done? You need to identify that. Then, ask if it has been done. So if in a DPIA, 
who identified that a particular control needed to be put in place, that a particular piece of text had to be on a screen in a web form. And when you look at it as part of the post implementation review, it's not there. You then need to understand why. Was a requirement missed? Was it removed from the scope? Has the requirement been met in another way that equally manages the, the risk? And, or has it been dropped completely? And if why, understand why that was happened. It's important to identify what worked and what didn't work in terms of doing. Why did the DPIA not get implemented? Why was the DPIA done too late? Why did you have to have lots of change requests through the project because people hadn't identified potential data protection issues and risks? Again, a smart DPO who's using a post implementation review methodology or has managed to integrate data protection questions into the post implementation review methodology that organizations should be following as part of their project management methodology, you can get people to understand the benefit of engaging with the DPO early by getting them to realize that the reason things didn't work was because no one asked the right questions. Usually it's conducted in a workshop type review. So Peter, what does good look like in a post implementation review? Short, it's succinct. Uh, you know, it's post implementation review, so it's the end of the project. You know, you should be, you know, it, it should be relatively quick to implement, uh, and it should answer the important key questions. Uh, yeah, the important key questions are: Was X done? If not, why not? What were the lessons learned? And yeah, you know, then what are the recommendations for improvements, the controls, and the processes, the overall project management processes to ensure that yeah. You know, uh, as you go forward, you know, you're increasing the level of excellence in all of your project management systems. In terms of pitfalls and mistakes, the most obvious pitfall is not doing a post-implementation review. And we see this more often than I'd be comfortable with as a former program manager in, in telco sector. Another key pitfall is not being clear on the defined scope or deliverables for the project. So again, Part of your post-implementation post -implementation review will be simply saying, this project wasn't clearly spec, so no one knew what it was they were supposed to deliver. And also, not doing the root cause analysis, not understanding why these things went wrong, but simply saying they went wrong um, or they weren't done. It's tempting to blame people for not doing things. It's mo much more beneficial to the organization to understand what barriers prevented people from doing it in the first place. So. To conclude, in order to pick the right tool for the job, you need to understand your objective and you need to understand the difference between the different tools. The DPIA has a design focus and it's aimed to, aiming towards preventing issues in the organization. An audit has an informed focus and it's about detecting deviations from the expected norm and standard in the organization and to inform the organization that the stuff everyone says they are doing they aren't doing. An after action review has a control focus. It's focusing on validating that the things you expected to be done have actually been done. And a maturity assessment has an evolutionary focus. It's about improving not just the process, but the organization. It's about improving a broad organizational capability in terms of managing data, managing information, and better delivering on the objectives for the organization. So if anyone has any questions now, there's a Q&A button. You can just pop your questions in in text, and we'll, uh, we'll address them. If not, uh, we will finish in two minutes. So we have one question on evidence-based decision-making. So <clears throat> what sort of evidence of decision-making should be recorded for DPIA? Well, in terms of the evidence of decision-making, there are a couple of things you need to be recording. Uh, one, the first decision is what is the business need that is being met uh, by this proposed processing? Be very clear why this is being done. Um, the other aspect of decision-making you need to be recording is 
why you have why you are doing or not doing a DPIA. That's an important decision to log. Um, other decision making to record would be your determination of what is the scope of the information environment you're operating within. Uh, is it like is their personal data directly identifiable or indirectly identifiable? All of which drives out your level of risk uh, potentially. Um, and ultimately, within the DPIA, what you're looking to capture is a well-rounded discussion and exploration of the overall processing environment as it is designed. Within the assessment of your risk, understanding what the root causes of risks are is an important piece of your decision-making process because that then allows you to identify how the remediation action or requirement you're putting in as a, a, a requirement as an output of your DPIA addresses the actual cause of an imp a risk or impact to the data subject or your organization from your DPIA. So, do you have any other questions? If anyone wants to find out more about the type of evidence and recording or decision making process in a DPIA, we, we're running an, uh, a course, uh, a half day course on data protection impact assessments on the 23rd of April. Uh, that is currently scheduled as an, uh, an on site course in Dublin Chamber of Commerce, but will be deliverable in an online form as well on the same day as an instructor led course. Uh, details are on castlebridge.ie slash events. Okay, if you have no other questions, we will close the podcast, close the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Recording will be sent out to everybody.